Well, you know, Jesse, it's kind of like time for our yearly checkup with Marcus <laughs> Lee. He's the CEO of Eli. Um, he's talking to us today from Beijing. Uh, Marcus, thank you so much for joining us again. Thanks for having me on the show again. So it's uh, it's nice that we talked to you two years ago, then a year ago, and we can kind of see the progress of what's going on with the company. So I just want to dive right in. What is going on with Eli right now? I mean, EVs in general are exploding. Um, and you're making such an exciting uh, small EV. Please tell us like, what's going on in the world of Eli. Absolutely. Like you said, the EV market is definitely booming. But within that surge, there's an even more dynamic niche that we've positioned ourselves in. It's the micro EV segment. When we spoke last time, we're just getting into small batch production of Eli Darrell, our first micro EV. And now we've shipped uh, over 300 vehicles. And this year, we're making a biggest leap forward. And we're scaling up our production and expanding our footprint in the European market. And we're expanding into new countries like Spain, Portugal, and Estonia. And of course, we'll continue to grow our existing market as well. Uh, we also planned a limited US launch for later this year with a special version of Eli Darrell. And finally, we've grown our production team and we've all recently just moved into a new facility with increased capacity. So things are happening very quickly at Eli and we're super excited to see what the next 12 months holds. Now, I feel kind of lucky because um, last summer I got to drive around in Eli in Spain. Um, sorry, you didn't get to <laughs> do that. But we are going to be in uh, Amsterdam next month. And hopefully we've been talking to Marcus. Hopefully we'll be able to get ourselves into a zero there and drive it around the city. So I'm really excited to check that out. I can't wait. Yeah. And so, of course, we're talking about the Eli Zero. That is the vehicle that you're producing. And it's uh, kind of a fun uh, new take on transportation. Do you want to just kind of take us through again, you know, what the Eli Eli Zero is and what it can do. Yeah, I'd love to tell you more about Eli Zero. So Eli Zero is our first micro EV. And um, our mission at Eli is to address some of the major issues facing urban environments today. Uh, and these are things like congestion, pollution, and the lack of parking and road space. Uh, if you think about it, almost 70% of the population is projected to live in cities in the near future. And urban space is going to be an increasingly valuable resource. So we believe the solution to this problem lies in a new category of vehicles called micro EV. And these vehicles are specially designed for urban areas and for short trips. And so Eli Vero is our first micro EV. It's compact, it's efficient, it's really easy to drive and easy to park. Although it's only a third the size of a regular car, um, but it feels spacious and comfortable with even more visibility than a conventional car. We've also packed a lot of the essential automotive features into an incredibly small profile. And uh, one thing I think that's very exciting about micro EV space is that although there's been steady growth in the adoption of full-sized electric vehicles, the micro EV market is still in its infancy especially in the US. So when I think about the opportunity for disruption, it's when market penetration is still very low. And so this gives us a lot of opportunity to grow. We see the micro EV market being a in a very similar place to where EV was um, 10 or 15 years ago. I think it was uh, back then it was even the EV market was seen as a very niche uh, market and only began to be recognized as an option. So of course, we're still at a very early stage going into production was our first product and starting to scale up. But we're looking ahead and we're seeing a lot of room uh, to expand and grow in this market. Now, you just said that you started the small batch production, you made your first few hundred vehicles. So who are the first customers to get their hands on them? Great question. Um, there's nothing more exciting to me than to see the vehicle in the hands of customers. So what we found is that our early customers are individuals who prioritize convenience and efficiency and really value their time. And they want to be able to get from A to B really easily. And they want to have the ability to easily park near wherever they're going. And they like the ease and benefits of a micro mobility product, but with the comfort and utility that a car can provide. 
And our customers, they, they normally, they start with the design and loving the design of the vehicle, but then they are very proud of the sustainable choice that they're making. And they want to make that statement of driving a greener option and be seen in a car that takes up less space in cities. So although Eli Viral um, is bought by some of the customers as their second or third vehicle, it quickly become their most frequently used vehicle. And that's exactly what the car is designed for. It's a compact solution that simplifies people's lives. And you can leave their uh, chunkier and larger vehicle for those long distance trips that, that are actually not that frequent. In terms of our demographics, we're actually seeing a very wide variety of customers from someone as young as 14 year old in Italy to a 94 year old in Austria. And we even have a high profile Dutch athlete as a customer. So it's really amazing to see the product having a broad appeal to a variety of customers who all value convenience and want to right size their vehicle they drive for their daily trips. That's great. So a lot of European sales happening now. And um, really interesting that you have a 14 year old driving your vehicle. Can you talk a little bit about why the Eli Zero enables a 14 year old to drive it around as compared to a conventional vehicle where mm, I don't think you're <laughs> supposed to be driving if you're 14? Yeah, this is actually super interesting. It's one of the advantages in the micro EV space in Europe. Um, in a lot of European countries, Eli Zero falls under a category called L6e or a light quadricycle, and it's it's allowed to be driven without needing a full driver's license. This policy opens up the opportunity for young drivers to be able to get around in a car. And depending on local regulations, someone as young as a 14-year-old or 15-year-old can legally drive an Eli Zero. So this makes it possible for uh, Eli Zero to be a young generation's first car. And it's not just the younger generation who benefits from this. Um, older and senior uh, customers might also prefer to drive in a smaller and more manageable vehicle without needing a full driver's license. So simply put, the, the licensing requirements for micro EVs are much more accessible in Europe. And that's what makes Eli Zero a really attractive option for even more wider uh, demographic than a regular car. Man, I wish I had an Eli Zero as my first <laughs> vehicle. Um, you know, I think a lot of people might think that the the range of the Eli Zero might be limiting, um, but what was really limiting in in my first car was that I, I, I the range wasn't that good just because it would break down if I went that far. <laughs> right. So <laughs> at least I could get back with the Eli. But you know, people watching might be like, wait a minute, how does Europe allow this? Maybe you can explain. It has something to do with speed, right? Yeah, so the Eli Zero falls under what's known as the light quadricycle category, specifically the L6E class. And this class of vehicles is limited to a top speed of 45 kilometers per hour. Um, you might think that's limiting, but considering the context of uh, urban mobility, so many European cities actually have default speed limit that's even lower than this. Um, and it's not just Europe. Uh, in the U.S., we're seeing a trend where more and more urban communities are limiting, are actually limiting their streets' top speed to 25 miles per hour for safety reasons. So I think it's worth mentioning that on average, most drivers in the urban area don't actually exceed the speed, this kind of speed limit due to traffic and a lot of other factors. Uh, the way I think about it is that we can all drive a race car, but that doesn't mean that we get from A to B any faster in cities. Um, that's why there's been tremendous growth in the EV, uh, the e-bike and the electric scooter category in the recent years. I think people realize that they can get around just as easy without a full-size car. So we see a large space in between the mobility segment of an e-bike and a full-size car. And this is where we come into play. You know, we give you the ben benefits of both worlds, building vehicles that are better and more practical than either for 
uh, short daily urban trips. This is a really interesting use case that I didn't think about. When I when I talk about EV companies, I often think you have to think about Tesla. You're competing with Tesla. What I love about Eli is that you're not really competing with Tesla because mm -hmm. Tesla doesn't make a vehicle like this. And this is a way bigger segment than I think we think of. Because as a parent, when your kid gets to be, say, 14, when I think of putting them on the road in a bike, I get a little scared because they're sharing the road with cars. But if I think about putting them in, in a zero, then I think, oh, I'm not so scared anymore because they're in a very visible vehicle. And it's enclosed mm -hmm. and you can lock it. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, there's a lot of benefits to having a vehicle like that as opposed to a bicycle. Um, there's nothing wrong with bikes, obviously, but um, you do gain quite a few advantages by having uh, this Eli, you know, protecting them. Yeah. Yeah, you nailed it. Uh, Eli Darrow is absolutely a new breed of vehicle. It's positioned between two wheel options and the conventional cars. So we like to think of Eli Darrow as embodying the agility of a moped or a motorbike with the added enclosure, safety, uh, comfort, and convenience of a car. When people first hear about Eli Darrow, they normally intuitively understand the concept and potential benefits. Um, but once you actually drive and experience it, uh, you really get to understand that it's not a smaller car. It's a whole new thing. It's also more than just a vehicle. It's a lifestyle choice as well. And the change in perception is the key here. Once people experience a micro EV, I think it opens up the possibility for them to think about what a car should look like. Now, last time we talked to you about a year ago, you were just kind of building out your dealership network. Uh, the way you're going to be selling these vehicles is through dealers. And it sounds like now those dealers have gotten vehicles to sell. So how's that working out? How is your relationship with those dealers working? And how's the whole sales process going? Yeah, we successfully built a network of dealers and distributors across different regions. Right now, we're mostly focused on Europe, but the distributor model allows us to reach a very wide range of customers from the very beginning. But this also ensures that we have good after-sell services and leverage the expertise of our regional partners. The partnership we have developed uh, created very interesting opportunities. Uh, for example, we're selling to regions as far as uh, French Polynesia, where Eli Dero was actually selected as an official government vehicle in Tahiti. And in Bora Bora, Eli Dero is operated by Avis as a rental car. And that's something we're able to achieve through these kind of deep partnership with local distributors. And this allows us to cater to diverse market uh, across different regions. Wow. Tahiti and French Polynesia sounds like a great fit. Yeah. I mean, that's such an interesting approach because I would think if I was doing this, I would stay away from stuff like that because it's so much work. Like I would just be like, OK, well, I got to go talk to all these different far flung countries <laughs> On like islands. Right. And how do you get them there? But but like, yeah, your vehicle fits there so well. Yeah. So, I mean, kudos to you and your team for actually doing that legwork, because it seems like once you establish that, like you just said, you're the official vehicle now in certain places like uh, that makes so much more sense. It's a safe vehicle to get around places like that. And it's it's such a fun vehicle, I know, because I drove it, um, to be in. You just feel like you're almost like in a ride. Mm. And so being able to see beautiful places from that vehicle quietly, like, I don't know, I just want to go back to one other point. We were just talking about, like, maybe putting your kids on a bike. In most places, it rains and it snows. <laughs> um, and so there's those days where... Maybe not Tahiti. <laughs> Maybe not Tahiti, <laughs> but like in the Netherlands. And so, you know, your kid on the bike, now you have to drive them to school if it's that rainy day. Mm -hmm. But like if they're in a zero, it's like, yeah, you can handle this. Right. Yeah. And it's also safer and you'll be able to go further and you'll be able to drive regardless of weather. And uh, you'll be able to bring a friend, for example. It can bring a dog or you're, you'll be able to carry groceries. Uh, bikes are great. I'm a big fan of bikes. But their utility is still limited to being able to take on just 15 or 10 percent of urban trips and there are a lot of places where it's only comfortable to bike for around two three months in a year and it can be either too hot or too cold to bike um, and uh, in a lot of places bikes also have almost their own safety protection and eli Dero is designed to balance these kind of safety utility comfort and convenience. So I think at the end of the day, there's still a huge gap between a bike and a car. And there should be more choice between these categories because actually the majority of the trips, a bike is not enough and a full-size car is just too much. So like I said, um, we want to be the iPad of cars. 
just like how the iPad carved out its own niche between laptops and phones, becoming so popular that Apple now sells more iPads than all their laptops and desktop combined. We really see the same potential for Eli there. Uh, it's a really exciting in-between category, and we think it can become mainstream. Now, I want to talk, I know that right now you're selling in Europe, but eventually you're going to be selling in the United States. And I think that a lot of people in the United States uh, look at it and it's going to be in the NEV category or neighborhood electric vehicle category in the United States, which puts it at a speed limit of, I believe, 25, 25 miles an hour. So I feel like, you know, a lot of people are here 25 miles an hour and they think that's too slow for me. Now, Let's just say for a minute I was, uh, I don't know, like uh, pretty good at computers and hacking into stuff and I could get into maybe the comp port of the car. Could I, um, you know, is it possible to unlock the speed the limit? I'm just saying, is it is it uh, engine from an engineering perspective, is it possible for the car to go faster than 25 miles an hour? Well, technically, the Eli Darrow is capable to go a lot faster, but we limit the speed to 25 mile per hour in the States to follow the regulatory requirements for the NEV class. The speed is considered safe for both drivers and pedestrians on urban streets. In Europe, the speed limit is slightly higher at 45 km per hour or 20, 28 mile per hour. Uh, in the future, we're also working on a different vehicle class that will have a higher speed limit. Uh, but to answer your question, yes, it is capable of going faster, but we don't encourage modifying the speed by customers. Uh, and we have to limit the speed to what's required by the regulation. And I've always felt that the NEV category in the United States was meant to either just accommodate for golf carts or to kind of curtail, you know, basically an, something like an Eli. I feel like it's it's this category, which if it was just 30, if it was just 35 mm -hmm. would be a lot more useful. And I feel like. I feel like uh, there's going to be a community once you start shipping to the United States of people who have Eli Zeros and uh, might figure out how to kind of work their way around the regulation a little bit and make it go a little bit faster. Now, of course, you're going to say that uh, you, that you don't you know agree with that, and that's fine. Um, <laughs> but, but Jesse's going to try to do it. That's I just think that you know. Good old Americans <laughs> love their freedom, and uh, they're going to find because I mean, there's no physical limit to how I mean. It, obviously power limited, but it's not that power limited. Right. No, it's like e-bikes, how you can kind of unlock them to different speeds. Right. I know I get that. So, I want to go back to what um, Marcus just talked about with the iPad, because I think he's talked about this before and it kind of went over my head. Mm. But like if I take the phone as the bike, as the e-bike, mm. and I take the uh, laptop um, as the car, the big four seater American car, there's so often times when your phone just doesn't quite cut it. You want to write a, like, a longer email or play a bigger game, and it's like, oh, it's too small. The laptop and the desktop, that's more than you need. And yeah, the iPad is perfect. Same thing here. E-bike doesn't always cut it. It's raining out. You don't want to take the big car. I really do think that until you experience the iPad, you don't really know that you need it. Mm. And it's the same thing here. Until you experience the Eli Zero, you just don't understand it. I feel like this really goes back to butts and seats. The mm -hmm. more people who can just sit in it, and like I did in Spain, and just drive it around, you're like, oh, it has air conditioning. <laughs> like that was a big one for me. I hadn't thought of. It was a hot summer day. I got in the car. It's cool in there. And I'm like, oh, I'm not sweating to death. This is like so enjoyable. And I think it's those little things, or like Marcus mentioned, being able to bring your dog or your groceries, mm -hmm. that you're like, Oh, I can't do this on an e-bike. Right. Yeah. Um, sometimes an e-bike doesn't cut it and a full-size car is just too much. So it's funny when you think about how most urban trips are in this range between one to 10 miles, but neither an e-bike or a full-size car is purposely built for these trips. And when it comes to Eli Thero, I think it's really all about experiencing it, feeling the difference and uh, experiencing the convenience. And you'll be surprised by how compact it is, but you're still able to get uh, air conditioning. You get a lot of space and it's really easy to park and easy to charge. And even things like being able to make a small U-turn when you want to, and these kind of small things make a big difference. And this category really has only been gaining traction below the surface uh, recently. So it's still a very niche market uh, today, but we see a future where Micro EV, there's a micro EV on every urban street. 
this is really hard to imagine, especially when you see micro cars fitting so perfectly in on European streets. But it's not just about Europe. There's a massive potential market in the U.S. as well. In a recent report by McKinsey, they labeled micro cars as the next big thing、uh, in urban mobility. At、McKinsey estimated a total addressable market size of around 100 billion dollars. The speed limit for these vehicles is a starting point, but I think as more people are driving these vehicles,、uh, I think regulations might evolve because this is such a new category. We're also seeing a trend where cities are lowering the speed limit, the default speed limits, to、uh, much more safer levels. Like New York City's default speed limit is 25 miles per hour. So really, you can you can drive an Eli Zero anywhere in New York City except parkways and expressways. And I think the most important thing is that this is a growing segment within a very traditional and kind of boring automotive industry that really needs a lot of change to adapt to future cities. And our goal is to establish Eli as a leading brand within this exciting space. Yeah, and I mean, talk about emerging segments. There's so many. Emerging segments that have to do with batteries,、um, whether it's e-bikes, which have exploded in the past just few years. It went from there being like one e-scooter company to there being a billion of them. It also, I'm thinking of、uh, battery, like portable batteries.、Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it went from being nothing to oh, I have a little battery in my pocket that I can charge my phone with to now oh, I have a big battery that I can. Plug anything into, like a hair dryer, to now、uh, a giant battery that I could roll around and charge my house with. So these these new segments are emerging and exploding. And I think、um, the bigger the thing, <laughs> almost physically, the slower the adoption starts to、mm. happen. And so the, the e bikes happen really quickly because it's like, oh, it's just this little thing I can have it at my house.、Mm-hmm. But then once you start to go like, okay, well, I love my e bike, but I hate when it rains,、um, and I, you know, I don't want to ride my e bike, you know, thirty miles and then back.、Right. Um, I wish that there was something that I could, you know, do do that trip in the rain. Then you start to think, okay, well, if my e bike works, you know, and it just has a, a relatively small battery pack and can get me there, what can I do? With something that's just slightly bigger that isn't a car. But what I've been surprised about is there's so many companies that had this idea and we were excited about their idea and then they failed.、Mm. Um, they just couldn't seem to get off the ground. I think my personal thought was that money was so cheap that that they were just kind of like, oh, we got tons of money, let's take our time, and they kind of failed.、Um, what I like about Eli is that they seem really scrappy. You guys made it through this really tough supply chain time, so I want you to talk about that, Marcus. What was it like to get your small batch production going when last time we spoke there was all sorts of supply chain issues? Yeah, you're right. The e-bike industry grew super fast, partly because it has the advantage of a simpler product with less parts.、Uh, so the engineering process for e-bikes is a lot simpler. That's why so many companies are are building it, and there are all kinds of similar products out there in the in the e-bike space. But when it comes to micro EVs like the Eli Zero, it's partially a car, and it has two hundred to three hundred parts compared to、uh, let's say twenty thirty parts on an e-bike. So there's all kinds of complex disciplines. For example,、uh, NVH design,、uh, door enclosure, electrical system architecture. That's Tapping into the automotive industry to be able to build micro EV like Eli Zero. That's why you see a lot of concept in this micro EV space, but not a lot of startups actually getting to build them and put them on the road. But that's ultimately good for us because you want to be able to develop in a in a segment that has a higher threshold of entry that really takes. Uh, real know-how to be able to build build your product. When we're talking about the experience of getting to small batch production, getting it going when there was a lot of、uh, supply chain challenges, I think the key ingredient here is the capital efficiency, and this is something that's very instrumental to us. So this allows us to really think about the complexity of designing and sourcing parts. Through the lens of how can we do it in a very capital efficient way, we started as a team with strengths in design and product design, product innovation. But along the way, we developed a very strong supply chain team, 
and strong understanding of the production processes. It was a really challenging, but it was very necessary process because we see the potential demand for this category, but it takes a lot to, to be able to meet it. A lot of real behind the scene work. So I think de dealing with supply chain issues and getting to a small batch production was a really complex tax and required a lot of uh, understanding of not just supply chain and know-how, but efficient use of capital and a really strong focus on just being able to build and sell your product. And all these factors, they play a really crucial role in uh, our decision making. Now, what does the upcoming year look like for you guys? You, you've made it through small batch production. Are you going to try and ramp that up to bigger and bigger numbers? Or are you looking for more investment before you can get to the next level on that? So, you know, as you know, Jesse and I are investors. Uh, we've crowdfunded with you before. We're really excited to be investors. What is it from an investment point of view that you guys need to do to get to the next level? Yeah, this year is huge for us. We're trying to hit a couple transformative milestones. And the main one is we have an internal goal of building over a thousand vehicles within the next 12 months. And this is something we're fundraising on, something we've communicated with our investor community just a month ago, and we got a lot of excitement for it. It's an ambitious, but actually totally feasible goal, considering all the optimization we've done on our supply chain and production fronts. Achieving this will take us to the next level because it took Tesla over seven years to be able to build their first thousand vehicles. And a lot of EV startups that went public too soon and uh, was an inflated valuation, uh, they haven't even achieved this. So the first thousand cars is really big deal for us to be able to achieve at such an early stage. And this year, we also made a clear strategy to focus on three main objectives. The first is to focus on reducing costs further and optimizing our production process. And second, we're looking into expanding into new markets in Europe. We also want to test the US market with a special pilot. And third, we want to continuously improve Eli Vero and bring new features and improvements to it. We'll also be exploring and designing and developing new products on top of the existing vehicle platform that we already developed for Eli Vero. So with Eli Vero, we didn't just develop a single vehicle. We designed uh, the vehicle platform that is able to carry future products by changing the design. But with all these kind of progress, we are still actually just a C-stage company. And that is the baby stage in the life cycle of startups. Normally, C-stage companies are still doing marketing around prototypes and figuring out production but you can already find Eli Vero driven by actual customers on European streets. And I have to say that these kind of progress are all made possible by thousands of investors who share a vision to disrupt urban mobility. And so far this year, we've already had a lot of actual progress on improving unit economics, optimizing our cash flow, and we're very much ready for a new stage of growth. And you just talked about cash flow optimization. A lot of companies like Ford right now, they're getting into EVs and their first couple of years, they've had tremendous losses because they have to stop doing what they've been doing, ICE cars and make EVs and it's huge factories and it's lots of people. So there's huge losses, uh, $2 billion last year, $3 billion going to be this year. And their margins are incredibly low. In fact, they're minus 100%. What I'm wondering is, have you started to discover where your margins are at yet? I know it's still small batch, but like, are, are things looking good in terms of where the margins will be in the future? Yeah, we're fortunate to be in the micro EV space. And this is a segment that is generally has higher margin because of the lower material and production costs. If you look at some of the similar four-wheel uh, niche products, not just AEVs, but also golf carts and ATVs, for example, their margin is often higher than regular cars. But we're also not going for a niche market. Our vision is to take this category mainstream. And now in short term, we do anticipate a lower than average margin. And this is common for hardware startups going to production. But what set us apart is we actually maintain a very positive uh, gross margin from the very beginning, which is different from many EV startups running large negative margins for a very long time until they scale up. 
Our goal is to continue nearly um, optimize our cost structure and scale up production. But we have one inherent advantage that is our vehicles are just more efficient and use less materials compared to cars, which means our costs are inherently lower. We're still in the early stage of scaling up and our plan moving forward is to enhance that margin, but still provide a high quality competitively priced product to capture a growing market. So it's a balance of growth and profitability. Now, as you begun distributing these to your distributors and then to your dealers, um, I got to imagine if I was an early distributor, I might just buy like five and test the market. Have you been getting feedback from them as to, okay, they've gotten those initial ones sold. Is the feedback like, okay, we want more now, Marcus? Yeah, totally. Uh, developing distributors and building relationship with them is a process. And that's exactly what we've been doing over the past year and a half. Some of our distributors only received their first batch of Eli there last year. And we've been receiving a lot of positive feedback so far. And customers absolutely love them. And now our distributors have already developed over 30 dealers in their network. And they're increasing their order volumes. And we're anticipating the same trend for the rest of this year. In the next 12 months, we're going to develop uh, new major markets, including Spain and Portugal. And we're going to continue to strengthen our relationship or distributors and increase our market reach. So to answer your question is, yes, our distributors and dealers love Eli Vero, and we're improving our production capability to meet the demand. I'm trying to think of different niches that this vehicle fits into. Obviously, on Tahiti, that makes a lot of sense. Mm. I've seen lots of resorts, even in, in here in North America, where they will have a fleet of golf carts, mm -hmm. like well over 10 mm -hmm. golf carts that are used either for maintenance or for uh, guests to be able to use. Mm -hmm. And while golf carts are nice and all, it does give off a very golf vibe mm -hmm. and many different places they don't seem to fit that well. And right. I feel like the Eli would fit better. What has been your experience with integrating Eli into kind of a more upscale resort type place? What what kind of proportion of your market share would you say is that or do you anticipate? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, Eli Dero was designed with individual customers in mind. We're currently focused on individual users, but we do get a lot of interests for fleets and uh, as a rental vehicle, especially in upscale settings of resorts and sometimes campuses. We have an example of Avis operating Eli Dero in Bar Bora, and we know there are many different use cases for micro EV, and we already have plans for products purposely built uh, to cater different use cases and to meet different customer needs. And, you know, when I was in Spain as an investor in Eli, uh, getting to experience the car there. So I brought it down to a golf course and the experience was because I'm not a golf player, was people there wanted it not only to drive around the golf course because it's air conditioned and it's cool looking, um, but also then to drive off the golf course to drive into the little detail, you know, the downtown resort area of Marbella, because then it's like, oh, wait, I can just drive this back and forth to, you know, on my vacation or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's my entire vehicle. I don't have to worry about another whole giant vehicle. This mm -hmm. does the whole thing. And I was thinking to myself there as an investor, like we just hit the jackpot mm -hmm. because just this one place on earth could sell thousands and thousands of these and then just move on to the next city that does some, you know, is similar. Mm. So I really do think in terms of a niche that this is something that no other manufacturer that I've seen has right now. The price point is perfect. The features are perfect and the efficiency. And maybe we can talk about efficiency for a second because I think that gets lost. It's so small that it is super efficient per kilowatt hour. Mm -hmm. And maybe Marcus, you can talk to that for a bit. Yeah, so efficiency is a key aspect of Eli Dero's design. Eli Dero Plus has a eight kilowatt hour battery. It's a much smaller battery comparing to a regular EV, but you'll be able to get 60 miles of range out of it. So on regular EVs, you will only get 30 to 40 miles from eight kilowatt hour, but we are twice as efficient as conventional EVs. You know, when you drive, most of the power inside a battery actually goes into powering the car's own weight. By reducing the weight of the car, we're also increasing the energy efficiency of the vehicle. To achieve that, we also use lightweight materials and structure, including aluminum chassis and composite interior and exterior. So when you think, think of Eli Vero, it 
it uses half of the material as conventional sedan. And on top of that, we used lightweight materials for structure and for interior and exterior. And it also takes up less than a third of the space of a conventional vehicle. We think the waste of space, uh, waste of material, and waste of energy, they are really the problem of this century. And we want to be a mobility brand that changes this kind of conventional expectation of how far it should drive, how efficient the car should be, and how big it is, what the shape should look like for the for the cities of the future. And it's so important. Once you start to lightweight something, then all of a sudden, you know, if you take a regular car or like my Model 3 and you were to chop out, what is that like? One tenth. Uh, yeah. So take out 90 percent <laughs> of the battery. Um, it becomes so much lighter. You start to look at the rest of the car and you go, well, the motors can be smaller because right. they don't need to be as powerful. And the brakes don't need to be as big because right. it's lighter. I don't need to. If In fact, they're, they'd be too big. Right. They would stop too fast. So now you can make the brakes smaller and lighter and more efficient and cheaper. And all of these sorts of uh, things kind of snowball into each other to make um, exactly what you're talking well, about. And that's why the vehicle looks the way it does and why it's it's going to be so much like you're saying space energy and uh and material efficient and charging speed again this is one of those things where until you own one or mm. you really get to use it you don't really think about that i think it's a stopping point for a lot of people where they're like i don't know how i'm going to charge this thing but it's like it charges so fast and it can charge on a 110 outlet in the us or you know a standard outlet in in the in europe that you can easily just plug it into your garage or whatever like an extension cord will do the trick yeah and that's a really big point because so for instance we just got our Ford F150 Lightning and it is so inefficient mm. compared to my Model 3 that I tried to drive it for a week charging um I have a very high tech solution for my charging which is a level 1 charger that hangs out my bathroom window of my apartment and that works for my Model 3 I'm able to charge it up overnight and just get and, enough charge and I get just enough charge to make it to work every day and and go back and do some errands with the Ford, because it is about a fifth as efficient as my Model 3, I wasn't able to actually keep up on that size charger. And I think that that's the thing that not a lot of people are thinking about when they're thinking about EVs. The more efficient you make the EV, the easier it is to charge it. That's yeah. why everyone can get an e-bike because yep. you don't have to install an e-bike charging station at your house. <laughs> right. You can just plug it in. And this is in the same size category exactly. as an e-bike. I mean, we have some e-bikes that have one kilowatt hour batteries. Mm -hmm. So you just multiply that by eight right. as opposed to 75 right. uh, for like my Model 3. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, like you said, the more efficient the EV, the easier it is to charge it. Uh, you only need to charge uh, 8 kilowatt hour to get 60 miles out of an Eli Zero. And that also means you can just easily charge Eli Zero by plugging into a regular outlet. With a 220 volt outlet, like those commonly found in Europe, you can fully charge an Eli Zero in about three and a half hours. So any regular outlet can be your charging point, just like how you charge your phone. So there's no need to rely on a specialized charging network or go out of your way to find a fast charger. As an investor, I'm really excited to see that you made it through this very difficult spot, which is going from, you know, prototype to production. I think it was really smart that you have this connection with China. You're an American company, but you, uh, you have this connection with China. So you know about Chinese manufacturing, which I think is like... It's a cheat code. It's like, why wouldn't you use this? Mm -hmm. China is good at this and you know that and you know the system. Whereas if I were to start today to be like, oh, yeah, I'll go to China and get something made. I've got cultural barriers, language barriers. I have to meet all these companies. Talk to me about the advantages that you have because you grew up in China and your your family is in this business. Yeah. So my family has been involved in the manufacturing and distribution of different type of machineries since I was very young. And they gave me some perspectives on how the supply chain works, how products are built. Um, I've said our initial strengths and our DNA was in design and product innovation. I do have a background as a designer and architect, and, uh, but I'm very personally excited to build innovative products with head turning designs. But I also know that's only a small part of the story. Getting a good idea built get it built at scale, at a reasonable capital expenditure, at a sustainable unit economics, required a lot of attention to how you build the infrastructure for supply chain and the system for production. 
And most importantly, uh, for startups, you have to, to make it work in a very capital efficient way. So that's something very important to us. And we've achieved a lot of real progress with a lot less investment. Uh, that means minimal dilution to investors while also building a sustainable operation. And that's, um, we look at a lot of EV startups, especially a micro EV startup, a lot of interesting concept, but it's really easy to undermine the complex process of getting cool designs built. And one thing we're also doing differently is how we build these vehicles. So traditional car manufacturers, uh, they involve complex process like stamping and welding and painting. And these can be very challenging to replicate across different locations. Our vision is to be able to build these micro EVs like how you build a household uh, electronic appliances. Uh, we've developed a vehicle around making it easy to be built by an OEM and allow us to work with different manufacturer partners and right now we're starting in China, but in the future, we can assemble these vehicles at location in different markets. We're still at a very early stage and there are a lot of behind the scene work happening to pave the way for future scaling up. But we're very excited about the potential where we can take this vehicle and how we can change how, how vehicles are built. We're just really confident about potential of this vehicle class. Uh, and we're really excited to to grow to fulfill the market needs. I want to talk about inflation and prices. So I know it's been a really tough couple of years in terms of inflation. And how has that affected your pricing of the vehicle? Because one of the things I love about this vehicle is you were able to keep the price reasonable um, and affordable. Not just inflation. Uh, we went into small batch production during the pandemic. And it was really challenging for a startup to deal with. Uh, we also have a very international operation. We have to coordinate between the US, China, and our markets in Europe. The pandemic feels like a long time ago, but just last year, I was still, I, I got stuck in Korea trying to fly into China from San Francisco. So there were a lot of disruption in logistics, and uh, there were a lot of higher cost of parts and raw materials. Uh, but our team were very quick to adopt to these challenges, and we learned to find ways to get around these problems and turn this into something we're good at solving. I think in the end, a lot of these challenges actually helped us to optimize our process and reduce our costs in the long term. Inflation also have an impact on our cost structure, but we've managed to counter these increases by making a lot of impressive progress in unit economics, especially this year. And we're anticipating even more cost reductions in the next couple months. Um, so there are always going to be these external challenges, uh, but our team actually used it as an opportunity to grow. So on the hindsight, that it's almost a good thing that we were challenged with these hurdles at the very beginning and get to become stronger as a team. Now we're scaling up. We will benefit a lot from economy of scale. Another thing about inflation is that it's actually a great opportunity for us to showcase the appeal of an affordable, energy efficient vehicle. Like last year, even the electricity cost in Europe was really high. So being twice as efficient as uh, conventional EVs is also a very appealing feature. We get emails from um, people all the time asking us, okay, Zach and Jesse, you were right about Tesla. I made a lot of money, but I don't want my entire portfolio to be in Tesla. That's not good. I want to diversify. What else should I invest in? Well, the reason we're doing this with you right now on disruptive investing is we think that you are disrupting this market. And so talk to me about how people can get on board and invest if they want to. What are kind of the minimums? If people are new at crowdfunding, can you explain it to them about kind of in a nutshell, what is this all about? How does this work? Because you're not on a public market. So can you just kind of explain the whole crowdfunding thing to us? Glad you asked. Uh, we're super proud to be a crowdfunding company. And we believe equity crowdfunding is a powerful way to democratize startup investments. And it's a really cool way of building a company. So normally only institutional and VC investors get to invest and capture the early stage growth of startups. And in most cases, investment opportunities aren't even open to retail investors until after the company is mature in public, but then the company has already passed its biggest stage of growth. So with Eli, we allowed almost anyone who share our vision to invest in the company. Uh, our investors are part of the funding story. And we want to be a different kind of EV brand 
with many investors joining our journey from the very beginning. I think it's a really cool thing to be able to do that. And there are already over 3,000 people joined us as investors through equity crowdfunding. And this gives them an opportunity to have a direct line at the company, receive internal news and updates, give us suggestions and ideas, and, and just generally interact with the company. So for those interested to learn more, it's pretty simple. Uh, you can just go to our website, invest.eli.world, and subscribe to our shares. Uh, the platform we use does require additional information from you for compliance purposes, but most people will be qualified to invest. Our current round is only open for a limited time, but uh, if you're interested, definitely go to our website, invest.eli.world, and learn more about it. Now, as an investor, I like to know the upside. And in this case, there's a lot of potential upside here. As you mentioned, this is a huge uh, TAM. But I'd like you to talk about what are some of the potential challenges, the things that could go wrong. So this year, we're looking to transition from the startup phase into a growth phase. And what this means is that we need to scale up our operations to meet the increasing international demand for our product. And this is not an easy task. It requires a lot of fine tuning and adjustments, especially when it comes to improving unit economics and to manage our cash flow efficiently. So we've always been very mindful of being uh, capital efficient. It's actually one of our strengths and we need to continue to be frugal while hitting important milestones. But we're not just focusing on the challenges. We're also actively expanding our efforts in marketing and business development to capture more opportunities. And we need to be very conscious of how we communicate our message and how can we rally more support to our costs. I think this is also part of the story that I don't understand well. I don't think many investors understand well. They think, okay, well, you made this prototype and now you're making the actual vehicle. Great. Okay, so why can't you just make more of them and make more money? Like, that's what I would do. So, like, why not just, you know, get in that factory and make more? But that's not how it works, right? You have to get suppliers and you have to line up parts and you can't order too many parts. You can't order too few parts. So, like, can you walk us through this kind of how you're threading the needle right now? Yeah, exactly. Uh, we have to be very careful uh, coordinating between your stocks and your order and your production ca capacity and your supply chain capability and you're dealing with over 50 key suppliers and probably over 200 sub-assemblies individual parts on your bottom sheet so it's going to be a lot of coordination and careful planning between financial supply chain quality and production so it's really about juggling through this whole process but that's also how you find your team to be able to get to a point where everything balances and then that's where the magic happens is that you're able to just pump out your vehicles in a bit of more fine-tuned symphony that's a good way to put it i like that fine-tuned symphony um so i kind of get this next year you're going to be ramping up you have a really ambitious goal to make a thousand of them talk to me though about like your four or five year goal like what will the company look like if, if everything goes the way you'd like it to in four or five years yeah, that's a good question. So I already said we're trying to put out a hundred thousand vehicles within the next 12 months. And we think we can do it with the support of our existing investors and with new investors who are uh, interested to join our journey. And so this would actually put us on track towards a potential 500% year over year growth over the next three years, which is from our understanding of the market and how fast the market is growing on the demand side. It's not just our goal. It's, it's something we think it's possible to hit. But again, we need to fundraise to hit these goals and we need to grow internally as a team and as a company and as a brand. Um, but this is definitely the most exciting stage for us right now. And we're hoping to zoom past this stage and get to a whole new growth stage. That's really exciting. And I want to kind of end with a little bit of a thought process here. I think that it's hard for people when they see a vehicle like this to go, okay, but I don't see these vehicles. Mm. And I think that the big thing here is that there just wasn't a way for these vehicles to exist mm -hmm. until maybe five-ish years ago where, you know, batteries weren't really at a point where we could do this. A lot of the supply chain in terms of um, parts and stuff just didn't come out. And so I think a lot of people also don't see where this fits on the road. Mm -hmm. And that brings me to kind of a chicken and the egg problem where there weren't any airports until we had airplanes. <laughs> Good point. And uh, roads did not look the same until we had the automobile. Right. We tend to need something 
that is a useful thing before we find a way to implement it into our lives and into our infrastructure. Right. Garages weren't popular until we had carriages. Right. You know, we went from stables to garages because the thing that we rode around on changed. Right. And I think that that's the important thing to think about here. You may not see a place on the road for an Eli Zero, um, but I think that as this becomes more and more popular, people mm-hmm. are going to want to have yeah. a First of all, smaller, easier to build, cheaper to maintain, friendlier, friendlier form of transportation that can be much more easily implemented into a city than adding another lane to a highway. I totally liked Marx's point about New York City and, and places like that where, yeah, I would love to see the city full of these vehicles rather than the traditional vehicle because it would make the city friendlier. You could fit more mm-hmm. parking spaces yep. because now the parking spacers are one third the size. You can fit multiple lanes in the space of a normal lane if this is what we're driving around on. And that's all you need. Most people in New York don't want to have a car. They'd right. like to have one of these. And of course they have, you know, we have subways and we have buses and we have all sorts of ways for, for transportation to get around. I mean, for goodness sake, we dug tunnels underneath cities mm-hmm. just to have a quick way to get around. Um, you can't tell me that making a smaller, cheaper, easier to maintain system of, of roadway right. is going to be impossible for cities to do when the space already exists yeah. um, in many cities. And all you have to do is downsize the, the transportation and make it a little bit easier for people to live and walk around. We're getting so sick and tired of the typical American suburbia with its, you know, six lane thoroughfares right. that aren't even highways. To your point, I mean, bike paths are exploding now in U.S. cities as city planners now see that there is a use case for them. And they see, like you said, until they were out there, it was a chicken and the egg problem. Like, oh, well, there aren't enough bikes, so we're not going to build bike paths. Right. And as soon as e-bikes start to come onto the market, we start to see huge support for more bike paths right. and, and more bike infrastructure. And I think that you're going to see the same thing for something like this. And again, we didn't have airports. Right. Until we had airplanes. Well, and and I think Marcus, you're talking about you know you see a demand for this. I see it. We're we're in this business every day. Yeah. I think that demand is not your problem at all. I mm-hmm. think that it's just getting the word out there. Like it's so smart that you got a marketing team going this year because as soon as people experience these, see them, go, what's that? Um, they're gonna open their wallets to this. I'm pretty sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think there's going to be a moment where people are just going to realize that this has always made sense all along and wonder why it didn't exist as a major form of transportation. And you look at the data of how people actually travel, it's very simple. People are not traveling as far as they think. And a lot of energy and road and parking space is wasted on oversized cars carrying just one person. You know, 75% of all car trips are under 10 miles. And most car trips are just short trips carrying just one person. So I think this is actually a huge problem that we definitely need uh, right-sized uh, vehicles to address. And you're absolutely right. I think sometimes there are products that until you see it, uh, you're not going to understand it. But when you see it, they're already everywhere because they just make sense. Yeah. Well, and, and to get to your point too, like I've had a L- Nissan Leaf as my secondary vehicle for years now. And this is an older Leaf. It MSRP'd for $35,000. It has the same range as... Your vehicle. Your vehicle. And it's used for short trips. And I think that a lot of people tend to think that like, well, um, you know, I need to make it to grandma's house. And it's like, that's true. So maybe you have a primary vehicle. Mm-hmm. But a lot of times a household is going to have many different vehicles because lots of different people need to get to different places all at the same time. Right. And it doesn't make sense for mom or dad to drive everybody everywhere. Right. And so having these secondary vehicles that can get around town and then when everyone needs to go to grandma's house, you hop in the primary vehicle. Right. and you drive all the way to grandma's house, that's a different thing than everyone having their own SUV or sedan right. that takes up a lot of space, costs a lot to maintain, and costs a lot to fuel as well. Yeah. So that is kind of what I want to leave everyone thinking about is well, this is just a new way to do it. And it's an easy sell because if you say your second car can now be so much cheaper and so much cheaper to maintain and fuel, right. it's a no brainer. People are going to go, oh, well, yeah, this totally makes sense. And so for my around town trips, I can take this, which is going to be so vastly cheaper and I can. Which I would argue becomes your primary vehicle. Exactly. And it's going to reduce the number of miles you're going to put on the vehicle that costs more to maintain. Yeah. Oh, man, I can't wait to get you guys in Eli Vera when you're in Amsterdam. We're definitely going to work something out. 
Um, Amsterdam is the ideal location to experience Eli Darrow. It really just embodies the the lifestyle we're trying to promote. I'm really looking forward to hearing about your experiences there. I can't wait to try it in Amsterdam too. Marcus, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having such a wonderful mission and forming a company that makes a vehicle that is going to make a lot of this a lot more possible. Again, if anyone is interested in investing in Eli, you can head to their website. That's eli.world um, and you can check it out. You can check out their vehicle and lots of different stuff. Thank you so much for joining us today, Marcus. Uh, such a pleasure talking to you again. Thank you guys. Uh, we're just starting and glad to have your guys' support. Thank you for having me again.